All right. Praise God. Welcome, everybody. Good to see your faces. And uh, it's good to be here tonight on a cold winter's night. Man, I don't know what's up with this weather, but it, it drops. Yeah, yeah we, we're, we're, getting, whew, we're getting some real weather around here. So the faithful have come out to hear the word of God, to be with God's people, and that is a wonderful thing because we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 5. If you want to turn your Bibles there, Pastor Paul used to like to say, and likes to say, start your Bibles. <laughs> you haven't said that in a long time. So start your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and we're going to be looking into these scriptures, but I hope that these scriptures look into us because what's wonderful about them is that it, it, there's almost like a, 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 a chain of events that happen in these scriptures, but really it's a chain of events that should happen in our own lives. You know, uh, when we think about the Lord being king of our lives, is he really king of your life? Has he taken lordship in the throne room of your heart? Uh, we're going to find in these scriptures that David is actually anointed king over all of Israel, uh, which is a wonderful thing to see because we've been waiting for this, right? I mean, we've been studying the first anointing of uh, David by Samuel at age 15, by the way. And that was his first anointing. And then his second anointing came, uh, I want to say, at the point we are now, uh, maybe seven years before or something like that. I, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe three or I'm not sure how the timeline goes, but he was in Hebron when he went up from, uh, you know, hanging out with the Philistines, doing absolutely nothing at all. But when he went there, he was anointed after Saul's death, he was anointed king over Judah, if you remember that. So he's anointed king over Judah. And now we see a third anointing of David. And uh, we want to look at that specifically because now this is where we're at tonight. So I want to begin to just read these first five verses as we get us started. Then we'll pray and we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in times past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came and the king of Hebron and the king and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed king. Uh, David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel in Judah. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you in these scriptures, Lord, and we recognize that any time, Lord, that we come into your word, Lord, we're stepping onto holy ground. And Lord, I, I just uh, set this time apart for you, Lord. Um, let it be holy unto you, and that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, fill us with your understanding. Uh, I pray, Father God, that you would individually speak to us right where we're at, and uh, even those who are listening online and that will listen on even after tonight. We love you, Lord, and we give this time over to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, okay. So, I, you know, we've been drawing parallels from uh, David and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Anytime that we could pull out a parallel from the Word of God, uh, we want to do it. Maybe even sometimes like right on, you know, and other times in principle, like, hey, this, uh, this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do in our lives. But uh, what are we waiting for? I mean, we're waiting for a time, right? When what? When Jesus comes back. And he's going to come back as, what, a, a baby in a manger? Or how's he coming? 
as conquering king, as ruler. He's going to reign. And, you know, what's happened already because of our celebration this past uh, couple weeks, you know, and really we start celebrating Christmas at the beginning of December. So we begin Christmas songs around here. And we begin to point to Jesus at his first coming at the manger. And we see this little babe wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in the manger, right? And we know the account. We know what God did in that time in bringing uh, Jesus at his first coming. But now we're looking at scripture and we're looking forward to the scriptures being fulfilled in our time. Even in our time. Lord, let it be in our time, right? And we're waiting not for Jesus' first coming, but Jesus' second coming. You know, the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And at that time, he's going to be uh, crowned king over this earth. Now, he's king in, uh, in heaven because he's assumed the throne. He's at the right hand of the Father. And it's already happened in heaven, you know. So just like the scriptures that uh, Pastor Mike used to like to teach us, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're already there. We just got to catch up, you know? It's already happened. It's already a foregone conclusion. It's already d done deal. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. But here's the question. Is Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in our hearts today? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we need to begin to ask the Lord, Lord, are, are you Lord over my life? Have I given you the crown that I, the little crown that I try to wear, the little throne that I try to sit on? And have I surrendered that over to you and allowed you to be king over my life? And that is a question that we should all ask ourselves individually because it has huge ramifications and implications in our lives. Uh, what I mean by that is that otherwise we're going to be very weak, weak in this life as a believer, as a Christian, living out this life of, of well, uh, I've given the Lord most of my life. Well, I've given the Lord um, a quarter of my life. No, the Lord wants all of your life. Every part of it. And we're going to see tonight that there are times when even the enemy will come in through great times of success, even in our lives when we, things are going great. You know, and the enemy wants to derail us even in that time and bring about sin in our lives. And we can fall to that. But there's also a time when the Lord is going to do battle for us. And we're going to see that too. So let's, let's go on. All right. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Now, these scriptures are speaking about the fact that, remember when all this civil war broke out? It, it was, it was, they were fighting each other. Brethren, you know? Uh, Israelites fighting Israelites when David was, you know, in, in uh, Hebron. And then the rest of the tribes were against David. They hadn't given him uh, because they had uh, Ishbosheth as the puppet king that you know, Abner had put in place sort of the, the power behind the, the king. And really, that's what we're looking around us today. <laughs> All these kings right now are puppet kings. They're puppet kings playing in, you know, world governments and all that kind of stuff. And, and the Lord is the one that's going to assume authority and power. And all that's going to be done away with. So it's only a matter of time before that happens. And we're waiting for that time, like I said, that we're looking forward and onward into that time when that is actually going to happen, when this happens corporately in this world. So can I tell you that all the tribes of Israel coming to David at Hebron, and indeed, they, they say, bone of our, uh, you are bone and our flesh. That means that, hey, you're, you're from among us. You're, you're one of us. We're acknowledging you as one of our, our own. So they claim David as their own, which is wonderful. After what? After all else fails. If Besheth is dead, <laughs> he's dead. He's gone. Abner's gone. 
And uh, then these two dirty dudes try to, you know, kill Ishbosheth and bring, um, their names were Re Rechab and Bana. And we learned about them last time Paul, Pastor Paul taught us on those scriptures that they killed Ishbosheth, which is the, the king over Israel during that time uh, that Abner has set up. And, you know, they, they try to bring this kind of thing to David and say, oh, yeah, we've taken care of Ishbosheth, now reward us. And what did they get? They, they got executed on the spot for what they did because they put their hands on, on this king and really murdered him. So now David and all the children of Israel are beginning to see, okay, David is king. So they're acknowledging what God has always said would happen, but now they're coming along and saying, okay, we agree. Verse 2, also in that time, in times past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over them. Now, who's our shepherd? Jesus, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's our great shepherd. And he's going to take us out and bring us in and take us out into still waters, you know, into green pastures. And that's our great high priest. But there's going to come a point in time where um, Jesus is going to rule and reign. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 10. You could turn with me there. If you like, I like to turn, uh, you know, get the scriptures going. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 10. And this is what's going to happen when Jesus comes on the scene. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the, the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those on hev in heaven and on those on earth and on those under the earth, that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So there's going to come a point in time where corporately the whole world's going to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. But what has the Lord done already? He has humbled himself and has made himself a bondservant, a servant to all. And that's really what David was doing. He was acting as a a good king over the people, humbling himself. And again, now he's waiting on the Lord. He's praying to the Lord. He's having a relationship, active relationship with the Lord, which is what we should have with the Lord as we walk with him and as we begin to rule and reign in, in, in the things that God wants us to do. You know, so that's what's going to happen. In um, So this scene, it says that the Lord... You shall shepherd my people, Israel, and be ruler over them. The Lord had already promised that to David, that he would be king over Israel, right? He was anointed by Samuel, and that was going to happen. And whatever the Lord says is going to happen, what's, what's going what's to happen? It's going to happen. God's going to bring it to pass. So, and that's what, exactly what David did. You know, when Saul was king, David would go out in great battles, you know, and he would go out with the people. And he would lead them out and bring them back in. And did he ever lose a battle? Nope. He was always going out and he would always come back in. But he was also acting as a shepherd over them. He says, you will be a shepherd over my people Israel. Now the Lord is bringing this to pass at the point where he was 15 years old, anointed by the Lord. And I, I want to talk about this anointing real quick. So he was anointed once right at 15 um he's now 30 and he's assuming the throne after what how much heartache did he have how much trials a lot it took a long really a lot long time for him to become king 
You know, sometimes we think, hey, Lord, how come it's not happening for me already? How come I don't have victory in this? What's going on? What's taking so long, Lord? And David was able to go through those trials and those things in order to prepare him for what we're seeing today. Him taking the kingship of Israel now and being king over Israel. But he says, listen, you shall be shepherd over my people Israel. He didn't say you're going to be king over your people Israel now. No, these people belong to the Lord. They belong to him. And David acknowledges that and knows that because he, he says so much in, in the coming verses. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron and to King David and made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Again, this is the third time that they're anointing David because the second time was when he was at Hebron when he came up to the tribe of Judah and they anointed him. So may I say about the Holy Spirit in our lives? We need a fresh anointing by the Holy Spirit. You know, we can't be like, oh, I remember 15 when I was 15 and I came to the Lord. I gave my life to the Lord. No, you know what? If you're 20, if you're 21, if you're 30, if you're 40, 43, we need a fresh anointing by the Lord. We need a fresh anointing. It's not just, I remember that one time. Or I remember when all the people came around and said, I want to pray and lay hands over you. You got to keep on asking the Lord to anoint you and fill you with this Holy Spirit. Because that is a fresh anointing. And I love that about, about the scriptures. Because when we're going through the book of Acts with um, Pastor Paul, he taught to us about what the Holy Spirit means to us in our lives. The Holy Spirit can be along, alongside someone. You know, sort of kind of wooing them, whether a believer or even a non-believer, calling them back to the Lord or saying, hey, you got to get right with the Lord, you know. Or you could have the, the um, what is it, Paul, the uh, infilling of the Holy Spirit, right? The upon, with. the with, upon. yes, the with, the in, and upon experience of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the end experience is when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in, into your lives, and resides in you, and you belong to Him. There's been a seal put on you that you belong to the Lord. And then you get this upon experience where you say, I need prayer, guys. I want you to f pray for me that the Lord will fill me, or that upon experience of the Holy Spirit. And that's... A wonderful place for us to be because that's where the Lord begins to use your life where God begins to say I, I, I want to use you for my purposes and plans that I have for you you know so look forward to those things so again all the people came the elders had come and they made a covenant be, between these kings right and King David and made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel all right Let's hold our places there because I want to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, beginning in verse 23. So you could turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. And I could read all this over us because I want us to see the, the extent of what's going on here. We see this in like five verses, right? And we're going, okay, that's, that's what happened. You know, they anointed David king. You guys, you guys want to see exactly what happened? If you go to... First uh, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 23, beginning in there, it says, Now there were the number of the divisions there was equipped equip for war, war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. Okay, what was it according to? The word of the Lord. It came to pass. This has been fulfilled. Everything that the Lord says in his word will be come to pass. And I'm going to talk about that, about our coming king. Everything that is said in scripture is going to come to pass. Okay? Verse 24. And the sons of Judah, hearing the shield and spear, 6,800 armed for war of the sons of Simeon, mighty men of valor, fit for war, 7,100 of the sons of Levi, 4,600 uh, Jehoiadad, the leader of the uh, Aaronites, 
and with him 3,700 uh, 700, uh, Zodak, a young man, a valiant warrior, and from his father's house, 22 captains of the sons of Benjamin, relatives of Saul. <laughs> okay, so th this is um, bone of my, you know, bone and flesh of my flesh. Th these guys were from, from, they were brothers, okay? They were all relatives. Now these are relatives of Saul, 3,000 until then the greater part of them had remained loyal to the house of Saul. Okay, these were hard, hard warriors that came before David on that day in Hebron. And for them to say, okay, it's time for David to be king. It was like, this, these may have been the last holdouts, but they're acknowledging that it's the Lord that's doing this. Uh, verse 30, of the sons of Ephraim, 22, um, 20,000, 800 mighty men of valor, uh, famous men throughout their father's house of the half tribe of Manasseh, eight, 18,000 who were des designated by name to come and make David king and of the house of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do to their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command of Zebulun, there was 50,000 of who went out to battle, experts in war with all weapons of war. <laughs> Were these, these dudes pretty tough, right? <laughs> this, is, this is no joke. This is the procession or the, the congregation or all the tribes that came together for this inauguration about, of David becoming king. Stout-hearted men, all right? Stout-hearted men. You don't hear about a lot of stout-hearted men today, you know what I mean? We, we need more, we need more stout-hearted men. Men that are just the real deal, right? Real deal in their homes, real deal, real, real deal in their churches. Leaders who could keep rank of Naphtali 1,000 captains and with them 37,000 with shield and spear of the Danites who could keep battle formation, 28,600 of Asher, those who could go out, of war, out to war, able to keep battle formation, 40,000 of the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh from the other side of the Jordan, 120,000 armed for battle with every kind of weapon of war. All these men of war, who could keep rank, came to Hebron with a loyal heart. Listen to this. Now at this point, what's happening here? There's unity that's coming to Israel. There's something wonderful that's taking place. David is gonna become king, not just in Judah, but over all of Israel. And now there's, there's, um, there's unity that's coming. They came with loyal hearts. They came with loyal hearts to make David king over Israel and to all the rest of Israel were one of one mind to make David king. And what does the Lord want to do in our lives, right? But that we would come to the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender with loyal hearts, with loyal hearts to him and say, Lord, I give you my heart. It's yours. And to be of one mind with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that we are of one mind, right? With the Lord. And they were there with David three days, eating and drinking for the brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were, who were near them from as far away as Issachar and Zeb Zebulun and Naphtali were bringing food and donkey and camel and mule and oxen, provision and flour and cakes and figs and cake, cakes of raisins, wine and oil and oxen and sheep abound, abundantly, for there was joy in Israel." Wow, could you imagine this great thing that's going on now? David is being pronounced king. Now, we're waiting for our king, right? How's that going to look? What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the Lord to assume the throne, not just in heaven, but here on earth. Do you guys want to see when that's going to happen? All right, good. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Now, I told you about the start of it in Philippians, right? Where every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Look at Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. It says, Behold, there is coming with cloud, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. That's all the tribes of Israel. They're even going to see him, the ones who pierced him. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Whew. Wow. That is a king. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to see further how he looks? Then I turn to see, verse 12, the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the uh, to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head, um, his on his head and hair were like white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes like the flame of fire. His feet like the fine brass, and if refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his hand seven stars and in his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword and his and his countenance was like the sun shining in strength and when i saw him i fell at his feet as dead but he said to me do not be afraid and uh and he says hey i'm the one that was alive then i was dead and behold i am alive forevermore and i have the keys of haiti and death write these things with uh, which you see and then he gives on John instructions. But man, that is our Lord. All right, a few more. I got I, I, I to gotta take us through this because this is who we're going to see. In Revelation chapter 11, look at what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 11. This is our coming king. Verse 15 says, Then the seven angels sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the worlds have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their face and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry and your wrath had come and the time of the dead, and they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroyed the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant, covenant was in the temple, and there was lightning and noise and thundering on earth, uh, quaked and great hail. That is the Lord Jesus Christ coming, you know? I mean, that's great power. But what does he say about the kingdoms and the governments of this world? They're going to be made to nothing. Because why? He's king. All right, one more before we get going. Revelation chapter 19. This is one of my favorites too because Revelation chapter 19 beginning in verse 17. Uh, actually, am I right? Oh, 19, Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judged and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He had the name written on one, uh, and no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him. Who's that? That's us. That's going to be a great multitude, like the great multitude that came before David. <laughs> you know, men of war. C could you imagine? We're going to be on, on horseback, coming back to earth with our king. Followed him on white horses, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule, rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the coming of our King. That is a time that we are actually looking forward to. But again, like I said, we got to do that today in our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own churches, that God would begin to do that in our hearts, that he would become king over our lives and that we would allow him to do that because that time is going to be a wonderful time for us to see what's going to happen in this earth. Not that you know we're looking forward to the vengeance of what's coming, but that all these nations that have ran around and done the things that they've done are going to come to an end. And the Lord is going to rule and reign in righteousness. Amen? Amen. So we're looking forward to that time. Um, just like in this time, they are now uh, crowning David king. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. Now when he began to reign again, from 15, took 15 years for him to get to the throne. And he reigned 40 years, 40 total years. Um, I forget if it was Spurgeon or if it was um, David Gusick, but I was uh, listening to his commentary on this. And they were saying that, um, I should have wrote it down. He said that in order for the amount of time that he was going to be ruling, a lot of preparation had to happen. Those 15 years of trials and uh, preparation was for them to get uh, ready, uh, get David ready for this time. In Hebron, verse 5, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, okay? So that's when he was reigning in Hebron when Judah made them, uh, made David king. And in, in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So that, that's a total of 40 years. Oh, by the way, the number of all the men that came before David during this time, all the men of war, were 340,000 men. Could you imagine 340,000 men of war <laughs> that can hold rank, that were loyal, you know? All, all that to come and anoint David king. That's incredible sight of what's going to happen. And for us, we're going to see an even more incredible sight. All right, let's go. Verse 6. And, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites in the inhabitants of the land who spoke of David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the, but, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. All right. Let, let me read 7 as well. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Okay, what's going on here is the Jebusites. Remember when I told you there's going to be a progression to our lives as we completely uh, consecrate and give our lives over to the Lord. Consecration is just surrendering, all right? Just giving our lives over. So, so let me just speak, speak plainly here. When we surrender our lives to the Lord and just, Lord, you're king over my life, there's going to be some battles that are, that are ahead. And guess what? He fights for us. He goes before us. You know, they're going to be hard battles to fight. But that's going to be the progression of a, of a true, real deal believer. In our lives, when we begin to uh, follow the Lord, there's going to be things that are going to come against us. More specifically, these things may be internal. And what I mean by that is that there may be strongholds that we haven't conquered yet. Maybe sin that's in our lives that we got to give over to the Lord. Stuff that may be holding us back from having a true relationship with God. You know, that, that thing that may be in the center of our, that nobody knows, that nobody sees, only God, He sees, but that we haven't surrendered over to God. Can I tell you something about that? That would make a Christian very weak if that's not taken care of. If we don't surrender that part of our lives to the Lord too, 
If we don't, if we hang on to fear, if we hang on to any kind of sin, bitterness, um, anger, if we hang on to, uh, you know, I've said it many times, you know, secret sin, pornography, uh, things that are hidden that we think that nobody else knows about, but God knows. Those are the things that God is, wants to deal with as well. He wants to be king over that too, because God's going to do a work. God's going to take that out and uh, replace it with something good, with the kingdom of his own. All right, let's see what happens here. So this, these Jebusites, as, we, uh, as they're called here, these Jebusites, remember uh, the children of Israel were supposed to go into the land of uh, the promised land and they were supposed to conquer all this land that was already promised to them? You know the only place that wasn't conquered up until this point? This is 400 years after Joshua goes into the land, okay? Guess what place was not conquered yet? Jerusalem. The center of Israel? Jerusalem? This place that had sort of high, it was a high ground. So these Jebusites, these Canaanites that are still there, sort of mock David and say, you shall come in here? Like, <laughs> what do you think you're doing? So you know what? Our sin can maybe tell us, what do you think you're doing? You can't get rid of this. What, what, what do you think? He says, the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. So they were thinking, huh, David cannot come in here. You know what? We may think, Lord, this is too hard. This is too difficult, Lord, to let go. Maybe you can't come here, Lord. But if you allow him that time and that space for him to do work in our lives, God will conquer that. The Lord Jesus Christ has come and died on the cross for that, for those sins in our lives. Amen? So we just begin to give that over to you. Nevertheless, verse 7 says, David took the stronghold of Zion. I love that because I want to parallel the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ is going to conquer that in our lives. Whatever it is. I, I got to tell you, I, I have... I feel like I have a little bit more faith today than I had yesterday <laughs> and that I had five years ago, that I had two years ago because I've seen the Lord do a work in my life and in the people around my life and I'm beginning to say, Lord, you can do this. You know what? As a matter of fact, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You guys know that scripture, right? All right? Amen. Pray that. Lord, you're greater than this thing that's in the world. You're greater in me. Lord, take the throne. So David cannot come here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that center part, and he called it the city of David. So the reason why Jerusalem is called the city of David is because David conquered it. David conquered it. It is the city of David. Verse 8, Now David said on that day, Whomever climbs up by the way of the water water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall become chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David turns that right back on them and says, okay, the lame and the blind, I hate. And you know what? Whoever takes it and goes through this shaft, so this was a, um, uh, a shaft called Warren's um, uh, sort of like a uh, I don't know too much about it but it's like a shaft and somehow they climbed up through it and went up and conquered Jerusalem conquered Zion and they this would have been difficult you know who wants to go in into a dark <laughs> shaft or in a dark hole and, and take care of whatever's in there who does that Jesus. He drops down into whatever hole we've dug ourselves into, whatever battle that we are facing, whatever thing that may come our way, whatever illness may come our way, whatever thing may, may come to distract us or, or to take us away from the relationship of the Lord, the Lord wants to jump in there with us. And he wants to say, I'll conquer it. I'll go ahead of it. Let me do battle. 
Verse 9, then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. All right, so David takes possession of Jerusalem and he calls it the city of David and it's the stronghold. And why is it the stronghold? Again, it was high ground. And in order to take Jerusalem, you had a, you, you couldn't. And that's what the Jebusites knew. But they got conquered by David. So, and David built all around from Milo and inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. So the Lord, so David becomes great, but who's with him? The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. This great God who we serve was with David. And you know what? This great God that we serve will be with Paul. This great God who we serve is going to be with Abby, with Ryan, with Dave, with David and myself. Oh, Lord, be this great God that's going to be with us, Lord, in everything that we do, wherever we want us to go, Lord. So David went on to become great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. Verse 11, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees? And carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. Then he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. This is God's doing. All right, so this king, um, these are neighboring, uh, the, the king of, um, then Hiram, the king of Tyre, this is a neighboring king. And they're now, they're now acknowledging what, what's going on in Jerusalem and in Israel. They become, he's become a king. So David begins to have allegiances and uh, political you know, allegiance. So that's a good king. And these people acknowledge him as king. So they begin to send cedar trees and carpenters and masons and they build David a house. Wow, that's favor, huh? That's like favor from others. Have you ever had favor from people just because you belong to the Lord? You're walking in God's ways and they're like, hey, I, I like the way you work. And then they're like wondering why you work so hard, harder than anybody else. Well, because I'm working for Jesus. And they're going to show you favor for it. They're going to look at you and say, oh man, I want you on my team. You know why? Because they're going to see your character, your countenance, your faithfulness and people are going to acknowledge that God is with you and specifically it says so David knew that the Lord had established him it wasn't David that thought huh look at me I'm somebody great now and look at this king now he's acknowledging me and who I'm rightfully am no 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 you know uh, promotion comes from who the Lord let the Lord promote you we don't ever have to look out for ourselves and think, I want this, I could get that. No, allow the Lord to do that. And they built David a house, so great favor came and allow the Lord to promote you in whatever God has for you in our lives, whether in service to him or in work or in any other aspect of life. Um, this is great because um, this is a time of real success in David's life, right? So. Should we let our guard down when things are going good? No, right? We should almost sort of be on guard. Uh-oh, things are going good. Praise you, Lord, right on. So what happens? The Lord becomes king of our lives. We have some victory, right? We've, we've seen the Lord do battle in our lives, and we've conquered that sin and that thing that so easily ensnared us, right? And now... What's happening? Well, there's success. There's great things that are coming. Look at, what, look at what David falls into. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron. Also more sons and daughters were born to David. Now there are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shum, uh, Shamua. I'm going to butcher these names, but I'm going to try to do them anyway. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, those are easy. Ibhard, Elishua, Naphtag, Japhia, Elishama, 
Elida and Elifelet. I hope I pronounced those okay. But nonetheless, this is what David did. He took more wives. And that is a, a, a sin in David's life. As a matter of fact, as we know that that's a sin because in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17 says, you shall not, what? Multiply wives. And that was in direct um, uh, commandment from God to, uh, to anybody that would be king in Israel. As a matter of fact, let's go to it. Deuteronomy chapter 17 Verse 14 says, And when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it, and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you who, who the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You shall not set a foreigner over you who is not your brethren, but he who but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord God said it to you. You shall not return that way again. Neither shall you multiply what wives for yourself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. That was a... That was a a strict command from the Lord. Now we would go, well, he's having great success. Look at this. Man, what, how, how wonderful things are going for David. But he's disobeying a command from the Lord. And may I say, anytime that we disobey a command from the Lord, there is a reckoning. And what's, what David is going to have, I, I, I think I, when he did this, I forget what chapter it was, uh, chapter 3 or um, maybe 4, where he took more wives, it says, I, I, I sort of made a, a math equation. Anytime you add sin to your life, what does it do? It multiplies. It multiplies. We got to be careful because a little leaven, what? Leavens a whole lump. And that's what happens. You know, even in great times of success in our lives, when things are going great, we got to be on guard because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is what? Death. There's a wage. There's a cost to sin. We sort of think, oh, well, I'm just playing with the sin. It's not that bad. But can I tell you, there's a cost to that. There's a cost to that sin. We've got to be careful because there's going to be a payment that's going to be required. And sometimes we think, well, it's not that bad. You want me to tell you how bad it was? Jesus Christ paid with his life for every sin that we've committed. That's how bad sin was and is in our lives. So what we should just say, Lord, I don't want this in my life. Help me. If you need help with anything in your life, ask each other for prayer. Go to the brother and then say, I, I, I want to get rid of this. Get some accountability. Get some time in the word. Get some time in prayer. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through um, 9, let's read that because there is a principle that we got to follow in this because, again, I, uh, these scriptures, they terrify me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he, he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, listen to that. There, there's an answer to that, you know. We don't only have to ser serve the flesh or sow to the flesh. We can sow to the Spirit. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. There's a reward for those who, who say, I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to do that. I'm, uh -uh. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to obey the Lord in my life. So again, I want us to really zone in on this because David, you know, out of all the things that he has now come into the kingdom and as a king, the things that were the, the hardest in his life were his wife and his kids. So that, that he reaped here 
ended up, that which he sowed here ended up reaping in the future for David and it reaped havoc in his life. And we got to take good counsel for this and say, you know what, I don't want that in my life. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to I wanna reap to the spirit so that of the spirit I can reap everlasting. I want to sow to the spirit so I can reap everlasting life. Amen? All right, so let's go. This is sin. Do away with it. Don't get complacent. Don't get, um, uh, you know, in success. Verse 17 says, Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all of the... Uh, all the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Okay, so, hey, now the enemy's after them, right? Here's the enemy coming up wanting to find David. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephem. Yeah, Rephem. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again against the Philistines? So now what's David doing here? He's calling on the Lord. This is an active relationship with God. Can I ask you, do you have an active relationship with your God in our lives? That's what, that's what it means to have a real deal relationship with Jesus. You're calling upon him. You're asking him for help. You're saying, God, should I do this? God, should I move here? God, should I take this job? God, I shouldn't be here. I better not go there. Lord, what should I do in this situation? So David inquired, verse 19, of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? You know, he's, he's asking the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hands. That's the Lord saying, Go for it, David. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to deliver them into your hands. And you know what? The Lord's going to do that in your life. As you seek him in prayer, as you begin to just lean upon him, study his word, hang out with his people, see what God's going to do. It's wonderful because the Lord will begin to deliver your enemies into your hand. Whatever enemy may come against you, the enemy wants to rattle your cage. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy that which the Lord has given you. You know what? Don't give them any space. Allow the Lord to conquer that and allow the Lord to direct you in whatever trials may come your way. Verse 20 says, So David went to Baal Perizim, and David defeated them there. And he said to the Lord, uh, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me. So who does he give the credit to? The Lord. Lord, should I go? The Lord says, go. You're going, to have, you're going to have victory. The Lord gives you victory. Lord, I praise you. I thank you, Lord. Spend time in praise and, 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 and praying to him and praising him. Like a breakthrough of water, it says. So the Lord, he's like, the Lord busted through. He busted through my enemies like a waterfall, you know, like a water, like a big rushing water just busted right through them. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perizim, and which means uh, burst, uh, breakthrough of water. And they left, um, and they left their images there. And David and his men carried them away. So they they hightailed it and ran, and they left all their little idols. <laughs> so the men of uh, Israel said, "Okay, let's take these little images and chuck them and throw them away." So anything like that happen in your life when you have victory worship him all right let's see what happens next and we'll finish here verse 22 says then the philistines went up again uh, once again and deployed themselves in the valley of rephim this is the second time look at this hey then the philistines went up again and deployed themselves in the valley of rephim Therefore David inquired of the Lord and said, Lord, shall I go up? Um, uh, therefore David inquired of the Lord and he said, okay, so he inquires of the Lord a second time. Why? God had already given him victory. He could have just gone in and said, well, God's giving me victory. I'm going to go do it again. No. 
you know, likewise in our lives. Hey, if God's given us victory in the past, we can't just uh, uh, sit back on our laurels, as they like to say. Inquire of the Lord for everything in our lives. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard, give us understanding. Look at this. It says, Then the Philistines went up again and deployed themselves in the valley of um, uh, Riphim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, this is, and he said, the Lord said to him, You shall not go up. This is what he said for him to do. Circle around behind them and come up upon them in the, in the front of the mulberry trees. And he sh and and it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. So then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. Whoa, this is a, like a supernatural thing that's going on here, right? David didn't sort of fall back on what his previous victories were. Allow the Lord to work in different ways in your life. And God will do that. So look, it says, and it shall be... That when you hear the sound of the marching on the top of the mulberry trees, this is something supernatural that's going on, huh? This is not just something that's like, oh, what? what what's the deal here, you know? Um, right now, Pastor Paul and Jeannie are going through Ephesians chapter 6, uh, the armor of God, right? And it says, we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood, but against principalities and power and the heavenly places. And... We don't know sometimes what we're facing. Inquire of the Lord. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And if the, the Lord says, hey, listen to the marching of my angels coming on the mulberry trees. Stand back. God's going to do a great work because that's exactly what happened. Here's the Lord telling David, I'm going to do battle. And when you hear the marching on the top of the mulberry trees, you're going to advance and the Lord's going to take them out. That's exactly what happened here. And you shall advance and advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so. He did exactly what the Lord commanded him to do. As the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. <laughs> he knocked those Gezers out of the park. The, the wonderful thing about this is that we can also have a prayer life, okay? So what did I say? We allow the Lord to become king in our lives. When God gives us victories, he's going to fight those hard battles in our lives and allow him to con conquer it. When we have success, don't sit back and become complacent. Be on guard and listen to God's commands. And number four, have a relationship with the Lord in prayer, asking him a real deal relationship with him. Uh, I'll end here. I think this is one of Abby's favorite scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3. I got to find it. Proverbs chapter 3. You know it, right, Abby? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. I will be health to you, to your flesh. Amen? Amen. That is an active, real deal relationship with the Lord. An active prayer life that you're trusting in Him, not leaning on your own understanding, but acknowledging Him in all your ways. Amen? So let's pray. It was sweet to be with you guys. Father God, we just come before you and we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for David being anointed king, Lord. But, Lord, we're looking forward to the day where you're going to be king over our lives. And we surrender that even to you right now. If there's anyone here tonight that has not done that or that's listening in, I pray that you would do that even now. You could just say a simple prayer. Lord, forgive me for what I've done in my life. I ask that you become king 
in my heart. And I pray that I would serve you from this day forward and forevermore. Lord, do a work in my life. And I just thank you for all that you've done, for dying on the cross for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.